G'day everyone and welcome to the NAB Trade Wrap as we wrap up what has been a fascinating trade period. The winners and the losers as we go club by club. Here with me, Peter Ryan and Nick Bowen who have been all over it right throughout the trade period. G'day guys. G'day Matty, how are you? Yeah, going well. It's been frenetic, hasn't it? Oh, it's been one of the, the bigger trade periods I can remember. Drama every day. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Good trip here. There's been so much to talk about. So what we're going to do right now is go through in two parts, club by club in alphabetical order. Let's begin with the Adelaide Crows. They picked up a couple of Hawks and reshuffled their draft picks. Yeah, they didn't really get involved at all, or Maddie, until the last, almost the last minute of the trade period. They had key uh, targets before they started, wanting to bolster their ruck division and their key defensive stocks. Now, they missed out on Jonathan Giles, but they were able to get Luke Loudon from Hawthorne, which is, I think, a pretty good get, and he should provide Sam Jacobs with some support. However, I think down back, Daniel Talia probably hasn't got the support that he was perhaps hoping for. Um, they could have gone perhaps harder, I think, on the Hawks' Ryan Schoenmakers. He's elected to stay there. They've got Kyle Cheney from, from the Hawks, who at 187 is a really able tryer, but I don't think he's probably going to give them the support that they need. No, no drama, but the big talk at the start of the trade period, as we all know, was whether they'd trade Patrick Dangerfield early before mm -hmm. he becomes a free agent. They decided to stick with him, back their system. They've got a new coach, Phil Walsh, so they've gone softly, softly. I like what they've done. They've just, they've just basically got a few holes filled and then they've got a good list. Well, we're talking about Dangerfield, I think, all the way up until the next Correct. trade yeah, period, yeah. though. Of course, uh, he's going to be a big talking point next year as a free agent. But uh, let's get your grade, Nick. I've given them a C, Matty. All right, a C for the Crows. So the Brisbane Lions now, they picked up two Jets, but they've got no live draft picks until the fourth round on the Gold Coast. Yeah, well, that won't be too big a worry. They had to go through a, a torturous negotiation for Dane Beams, but what a great pick-up. They ended up giving up 5 and 25 and a young player in Jack Crisp. They also lost Joel Patful, but they got a good deal there. They got pick 21, and that pick 21 allowed them to get Alan Christensen. So... Justin Lepish in the last game of the year, he said they wanted to snare some a grows and they did. Look at Dane Beams. He's a fantastic midfielder, a goal-kicking midfielder. He's uh, polled over 15 Brownlow votes uh, in two of the past three years. He's won a Collingwood Best and Fairest. He's 24. He's at the peak of his powers. Christensen, was, he's had a back injury this year, but he's a quality player. He's played in finals. We've seen a great performance in a 2011 final. I mean, if you had to pick two midfielders that you wanted to come to your club at the start of the trade period, they would have been in the top 40 in the comp. They're, they're a good mix, I think, too, Matty. I mean, Beam's that hard sort of inside player and, and Christensen giving them a little bit of outside speed. I think the other win, Pete, for them as well is that they didn't give away that experienced player that the, the, the uh, Pies are really that's looking good for. Yeah, they um, You know, sort of the Redden and uh, James Ace sort of type. So that, that's a win in itself. For sure, and especially when you look at where they were as a club 12 months ago, things have certainly changed. Your grade, Pete? Well, gold star, an A. An mm. A for the Lions to Carlton now and they've lost a veteran key forward that seems like uh, so long ago but they've traded in a couple of young tools. They have many and I think that, that was you know losing weight left a real hole down forward for them but I think in Christian Jacks they've got a 20 year old who they, who they think will be a real real uh, a key for them down for quite some years to come. Liam Jones a little bit older and perhaps you know ready made and ready to go down forward as well. Got Mark Wiley from the Giants as well in that that Jack Steele who's, a, a, by all accounts, a really hard sort of inside midfielder, so that, that'll really add to their midfield mix. Of course, they've, um, they've given up a little bit in that. They've sort of, their first round pick, pick seven, goes down to 19, but certainly Jax, you know, is, is one of those guys that he's, while he is probably earmarked to play forward, can play uh, down, down back as well, and certainly spent most of his time at the Giants doing that. Well, now they've got Jones as well, there's a player who can play forward, so they can play Jax at yep, either yep. end. They're getting, they're stockpiling the club with a few players that have gone in first round draft picks. They did it last year and they've done it again this year. You know, it's quite a good effort from them. They, they might get Jason Tutt, I think, also from the Dogs in the uh, pre-season draft. What are you giving them? I'm giving them a, uh, sorry, just a sneak a peek there, a B. A B, B for the Blues. Now to Collingwood, heavily involved, as we know. There was so much going on at the Pies, wasn't there? They've lost an A grader, as we know, in Beams, but they have improved their draft position. They did. Disaster struck when Beams uh, wanted to walk out, particularly after Lumumba had uh, signalled that it was time to part ways with the footy club. But Collingwood fought back pretty well. They haven't probably replaced Beams and Lumumba, but they've got close. They made a massive offer to Greenwood. He's had his best 
year in the AFL. He's an experienced player, 24. They got Varco, which helped get the Lumumba deal done. I mean, Greenwood, look at him here. He is that sort of rugged player in the middle and the centre square, uh, centre square player that Pendlebury needs in support, side bottom needs in support. And Varco basically replaces Lumumba as that running half-back flanker. And they got Crispin. I didn't, don't know a lot about Chris, but he looks a good size. He's some gives a, the midfield mix another look and is young. So Collingwood's got a bit to work with there. Given the fact that they looked staring down the barrel as though they were going to have to go to the draft to replace Beams, they've done pretty well. I agree, but I think they have done well. I suppose the only question I might have is, is whether they've paid over the odds for someone like Levi Greenwood. Yeah. But, but we understand sort of $450,000 a season over uh, three years, so that, that's quite a whack. Having said that, I think the Pies go back into the draft at another early pick, pick five, and they've really done that quite well over the last two or three years, Pete, oh, I reckon. Yeah, right. no, it's good effort. Pete? The grade? B minus. A B minus <laughs> yeah. for the salvage Pies. operation. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. Now to Essendon. Uh, they've got another Ruckman to replace Paddy Ryder, plus a first rounder and a Brownlow medalist. On the face of it, they've actually done okay in the end, the Bombers. They have, Matty. I think that, you know, once Paddy Ryder dropped that bombshell at the start of the uh, trade period, it was really just about what they could sell which out of the wreck. Now, the Bombers aren't noted traders. That They've sort of been, uh, have a reputation of being difficult to deal with. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to be diplomatic here, Pete. I'm but sure Adrian Dodoro is yeah, watching as well. Mediation yesterday, things didn't look great, but I think today... Getting pick 17 and 37 really allowed that deal to go through, but it also allowed them to get the deal done with uh, Adam Cooney, of course, from the Bulldogs, you know, who's uh, at 29, sort of been re revitalised in the last couple of years. His knees sort of have really been coming a lot better. And, uh, and obviously got the Jonathan Giles deal done as well, who's, who's a ready-made sort of replacement for, uh, for Ryder. No one's saying he's, he's as good, but, you know, he'll certainly give Tom Bell Chambers some support. Cooney keen on the Bulldogs because of James Hurd and also yep. the spongy floor out at Tullamarine. <laughs> I hear that. And they're both uh, Brownlow medalists. Amazing that Cooney didn't uh, receive the coverage that he probably otherwise would. It just shows what a dramatic trade period it's been that Adam Cooney switches clubs and it barely raises a ripple for most of the period. The other thing that Essendon did really well is they held on to Winderlick, who at one stage looked like leaving, and Ben Howell had also re-signed. So they've done a pretty good job in that regard. Mm. Nick, a grade for the Bombers? A C, Matty. A C for the Bombers, says Nick Bowen. I reckon that was a late change, too. Fremantle <laughs> now, and uh, really a very quiet trade period for the Doctors. No action at all. We can see their, their draft picks come the Gold Coast in uh, next month. Yeah, well, once they missed out on James Frawley, who they spoke to around the free agency, they just went quiet. They always hold on to their first-round draft picks. That's part of their policy. They think they've got a good list coming through. They think they've got Apeness and uh, Tabernard to come through to fill a few holes. So... You know, they didn't do a lot. Go to sleep, Brad Lloyd. Do we give them a grade when they haven't done anything? Yeah, you know what you do as a teacher? You give them a C. <laughs> <laughs> done. Yeah. Now to the Cats. A really interesting trade period for them with Christensen and Varco out the door. They did get someone, though, to help out the Tomahawk. Yeah, Matty, I think the, uh, the obviously Christensen's the, the massive loss, isn't it? I think that uh, he... You know, I mean, obviously needed out of Geelong for, for personal reasons, so they couldn't do much about that. They're fairly pragmatic, and, and they got the deal done. Travis Varco as well, I think, you know, perhaps uh, was one that sort of worked out, you know, uh, probably a good time for both. But Mitch Clark's a really interesting one. We all know what he's capable of at his best. He's a risk, though, you think? Oh, certainly he's a risk with his foot. There's no doubt about that. He's, he's basically played really minimal football the last three years. But, look, he can run around in the ruck um, like, like Reece Stanley, and both can pinch hit sort of forward. So they're, they're good pickups. My question with Stanley is whether they've paid over the odds. I reckon pick 21. I know they got pick 60 back. That's a pretty massive price, and, and, and I reckon the St Kilda, at least on face value, win that one. Do you reckon overs for Stanley, Pete? Oh, definitely overs, but uh, what it does show, they've got Stanley and Clark, and they must have a few doubts about their ruck stocks, Dawson, Simpson, McIntosh. They've battled with injury and they weren't available or firing at the end of last season. The other thing that they've done late in the uh, trade period is they managed to snare pick 10 for pick 14, so they've got a top 10 pick. Pretty good result. And Neil Baum was disappointed about the lack of Monte Carlos on deadline day. A I great, like a great for we, the we Cats. We can have Neil disappointed with the biscuits coming out. <laughs> I've gone C. If I'd known about the biscuits, I might have uh, rated it a little <laughs> bit lower. <laughs> might have affected their grade. Now to the Gold Coast Suns. They have picked up two hard bodies to assist their young list. And they've kept their early picks as well, which I think is something that Suns fans can be excited about. Yeah, they've done well. They've got Melcheski. They've targeted a bit of experience. It's a bit of a risk. I mean, he's had a couple of knee reconstructions, but they didn't pay anything for 
for him apart from the contract. And they've also snared Mitch Hallahan, who the Hawthorne really like. He's a quality player, and they've managed to do that deal. So that's a great effort. Did they get Hallahan cheaply in the end, you reckon? Uh, I think it was pretty cheap, uh, but Hallahan's been there for four years. He's only played six games, so Hawthorne didn't, really couldn't uh, put on an incredibly hard bargain for him. All right, great. B+. Plus. B plus for the Gold Coast Suns. The Giants now, they did get busy, didn't they? One of the stories of the trade period. Losing some youngsters, gaining some elite talent and gaining more top-end draft picks. Well, Matty, obviously I think it all centred around the Ryan Griffin-Tom uh, Boyd deal. Um, look, I think when you look at the actual result itself, it, it's a pretty good one that they got Griffin in, who's an experienced midfield star. And, and they're the, he's the sort of hard-body player they need. And pick six as well. But having said that, I think where, where I probably mark them down a little bit is the fact that what does this say for their culture? What does this say to their, their young players who they're trying to keep? What does it say to opposition clubs who are you know, really circling some of these young talent uh, and young stars and seeing them as sort of gettable? So that, that's, that, that's sort of the concern for me a, a little bit. Uh, of course, you know, they've, they've sort of lost a, a few of the other younger players as well. Jax, uh, Wiley, O'Rourke, Frost. But I think that that's sort of always been something that's been, been part of the plan for them. They're always going to lose those players. But they just perhaps don't want to lose the number one pick like a, uh, obviously like Boyd. Well, it's going to be an ongoing issue. But I think to be fair to them, and uh, they were most adamant, and that was sort of disappointing in some respects, but they got Griffin's uh, salary assistance around Griffin, so they're going to have some uh, money in the salary cap. And Tom Boyd was just unhappy, it appeared, there, and therefore he's uh, wanted out. He seems like a little bit of a different character to the other Giants. Next year, this time, is when we're going to see the proof in the pudding. If they can re-sign some of their stars, then their strategy's OK. Just quickly, though, what about the way the Giants went about it? I mean, surely we can't believe anything that they ever say again. Well, we will be questioning and pushing harder, but things do change in footy. They probably should have just left a little bit of an out for them, but everyone learns from that. I think, Matty, that they, they would argue they genuinely believe what they were saying at the time, but the deal changed. The Bulldogs came really hard at them and, and made it impossible for them to refuse that. A grade? C. A C for the Giants, primarily because they lost Boyd? Uh, yeah, that, that, but also the message I think they, they yeah, sent. I, I mean, C is a bit tough because they've got well, Patful and Griffin. No, no, look, I think, see, I just think the message they sent to other clubs, let's see what happens this time next year. Yep. All right, good to see a little bit of argument from the boys on the desk here. <laughs> All right, you're watching the NAB AFL Trade Wrap. That is the end of part one, but stay with us for part two on afl.com.au where we'll take a look at the remaining teams from Hawthorne to the Western Bulldogs. Hope you can join us. <laughs>